Good evening. I am Brooke Lament, director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you tonight. Thank you for coming. I want to start off by giving a shout out to our terrific partners at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. We could not have brought you this exhibit or this great lineup without them, without their support. Um, we have a full evening ahead of us. In a moment, you're going to hear from Joel Goldstein. Joel is a highly respected scholar of the vice presidency and constitutional law. He's written numerous articles on co and commentary pieces on the vice president's presidency and has published two books on the subject, The Modern American Vice Presidency, The Transformation of a Political Institution, and The White House Vice Presidency, The Path to Significance, Mondale to Biden. And before we hear from Joel, we're going to be joined by the Archivist of the United States in a, in a short video here. Um, so please join me in watching this video featuring Archivist of the United States, Dr. Colleen Shogan. Good evening, and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Museum for what I hope will be a vibrant discussion about a vital yet overlooked facet of American governance, the Vice Presidency. As the Archivist of the United States and a scholar of the Presidency, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this gathering. Over the next two days, you will explore the historical layers of power and influence that defines the Vice Presidency. The opening of the Ford Library's new exhibition, A Heartbeat Away, provides the perfect backdrop for this discussion. The Vice Presidency has grown gradually in stature over the past century. Some notable developments were the inclusion of the Vice President as a member of the National Security Council, the addition of the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, and the Congressional designation of Number One Observatory Circle as the official residence of the Vice President. One of my favorite television shows is the HBO comedy, Veep. If you've watched the show, you know that Vice President Selena Meyer's perennial question to her scheduler is, Sue, did the president call? Despite the intended humor, vice presidents no longer sit around and wait for the president to call. As the complexity of government continues to grow, vice presidents will play an increasingly critical role in American governance and national security. I hope you enjoy the conference. Well, good evening. Um, Brooke, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it's a real treat to be included in this, in this conference. The presidential libraries, by their stated mission, promote understanding of the presidency and the American experience through materials and programs that educate and inspire. It is therefore fitting that this conference on the Vice Presidency should occur and that it should do so here and now. The American Vice Presidency has wound a meandering path through American history with a remarkable upward trajectory, especially during the last half century. And that journey was touched in important ways by the public service of Gerald R. Ford. But the history of the Vice Presidency provides insights not only about our 38th president and our nation's second office, but about the constitutional democracy of which it is a part and the inspiring possibility of institutional improvement. President Ford's vice presidential legacy isn't primarily about his work as the 40th vice president. He held that office for only eight months and th three days, a shorter period than all but six of our 49 vice presidents. And the situation he encountered through no fault of his own, made that period, in his telling, the worst period of his life. But President Ford was the ninth and most recent vice president to succeed to the presidency to fill an incomplete term. So his ascendancy provides our latest demonstration of the vice presidency's a heartbeat away role. The Ford succession occurred amidst unique circumstances. He was the only unelected vice president to succeed to the presidency and the only one whose succession followed a presidential resignation to avoid impeachment and removal, not the trauma of presidential death. Moreover, 50 years ago, 
on October 12th, 1973, 10 months before he became president, Mr. Ford was the first person nominated to be vice president under section, 20, uh, section two of the 25th Amendment. Then a new and unused constitutional amendment, which provided a means to fill a vice presidential vacancy and to address vexing problems of presidential inability. This symposium marks the golden jubilee of Mr. Ford's nomination, and appropriately so. The amendment allowed him to become vice president following Spiro Agnew's resignation, and then president following Richard Nixon's resignation. And its presence averted a political and constitutional crisis. And the amendment itself reflected an appreciation of the vice presidency's value for presidential succession and a new vision of the office. Finally, this symposium is well-timed in place because of the vice president's current prominence. The office is in the news in unusual, even unprecedented ways. A former vice president, Joe Biden, is the 46th president. Only the sixth time a vice president or former vice president has become president initially through election. In running for re-election, President Biden seeks to be only the third former vice president after Thomas Jefferson and Nixon elected to two presidential terms. His vice presidential successor, Mike Pence, seeks the Republican presidential nomination for president. In an anomalous presidential primary competition between a former vice president and the president with whom he served. Pence's pro prospects are affected by reaction to his conduct presiding over the electoral vote count on January 6, 2021, a role which historically has been ministerial and perfunctory. And finally, the current vice president, Kamala Harris, is the first woman elected to national office after the prior 58 elections installed only men as president and vice president, and the first black and the first South Asian American person to be vice president. In addition to these historic events, the vice presidency has experienced a remarkable transformation the last 50 years, give or take, achieving much greater significance under presidents from both parties. It has moved into the White House and now provides a senior elected officer to help shape and advance the president's agenda on a daily basis. This change responded to developments during the Ford presidency, but received its impetus under President Jimmy Carter, President Ford's 1976 rival, his successor, sometimes collaborator, and friend. From Walter Mondale's term on, vice presidents have become an, the vice presidency has become an institution whose central function and practice is contributing to presidential success, not succession. The office is now focused on present governing, not future insurance, although the succession function remains and the expanded governing role enhances its performance. I don't have time here to fully discuss the vice presidency, but I wanna briefly touch on those three related topics. The vice presidency's succession mission, the 25th Amendment relating to Mr. Ford becoming vice president and president, and the transformed office, what I have elsewhere called the White House vice presidency. And I hope this account suggests that the story of the vice presidency is important not simply for its teachings about the second office, but for lessons about our constitutional system, its challenges and promise. The vice presidency's presidential succession mission is probably not why the office was created. The office debuted on September 4th, 1787, alongside the Electoral College, near the very close of the Constitutional Convention. How to elect a president vexed the convention, and framers feared that electors' preferences for home state candidates would prevent electing national presidents and forging a nation. Their remedy was to give electors two votes, but allow only one to be cast for someone from the elector's state. To deter electors from wasting their second vote, they made the runner-up vice president. Now, of course, correlation doesn't establish causation, but the joint appearance of the vice presidency and electoral college is quite suggestive. Like many innovations, this one proved better in theory than in practice. Contrary to the framers' expectation, national political parties developed and, and slated arranged tickets to maximize their electoral prospects. Since electors couldn't specify their preference for president and vice president, the system risked that someone intended as vice president 
could become president if he tallied the, mo tallied the most votes, even if they were really vice presidential votes. That almost happened in the fourth presidential election when Jefferson and running mate Aaron Burr tied. That debacle and the specter of, of even worse mischief produced the 12th Amendment in 1804, leading to, our long, leading to our longstanding system whereby electors vote separately for president and, and vice president, even though we the people cast a single ticket, a single vote for a ticket. The vice presidency remained even though its rationale was gone. The Constitution gave it two roles, to be president of the Senate with a vote only when the Senate was evenly divided, and to act as president in case of presidential vacancy or incapacity. From the beginning, the office got lousy reviews. John Adams, the first vice president, griped that he held, quote, the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. Adams said he could do neither good nor evil, the very essence of powerlessness. It was all downhill from there. In the early 20th century, Vice President Thomas Marshall spoke of two fictitious brothers. One went off to sea, the other became vice president. Neither was ever heard from again. <laughs> As you know, vice presidents and others said a lot more about the office, none of it good. From Adams through the mid-20th century, vice presidents regularly presided over the Senate, a bore of a chore. The Senate wouldn't empower a, a presider it didn't pick and couldn't remove. So vice presidents, as Gerald Ford later put it, took a vow of silence. They sat quietly, listening. Vice presidents rarely break tie votes, a little more than one per year. Almost 25% of our vice presidents, including Ford, his vice president, Nelson A. Rockefeller, and Biden broke none. While presiding, Vice President Marshall suffered as he heard one senator dramatically begin sentence after sentence. What this country needs is X. What this country needs is Y, and on and on and on. Finally, unable to contain himself, Marshall blurted out that what the country needs is a really good five cent cigar. <laughs> Making jokes helped Marshall cope. This one brought him many gifts of cigars. There is, of course, the successor role. As Adams put it, I am vice president. In this, I am nothing, but I may be everything. Fortunately, presidents don't often leave office early, only nine times in 234 years, or once every six and a half presidential terms. Only 18% of our vice presidents have had to complete their predecessor's term for about 26 years, about 11% of our history. Having someone ready and able to be everything is essential, but most presidential standbys have simply stood by. Until the 25th Amendment, the Constitution viewed the vice presidency as dispensable. From 1789 to 1965, the office was vacant 16 times for 37 years when the elected vice president served as president or had died or resigned. On those occasions, the Constitution didn't replace the vice president, it simply re reassigned his duties. The president pro tempore, the Senate presided over the body, and Congress designated another officer as first successor. No wonder Benjamin Franklin had referred to the vice president as his superfluous excellency. <laughs> this quick review suggests why the vice presidency long got such bad press. But the story was even worse. Well into the 20th century, presidential and vice presidential tickets usually combined men from opposing factions, even different parties, to balance the ticket. Thus, presidents and vice presidents often disagreed on basic issues. And until the 1940s, party leaders, not presidential candidates, chose their running mates. So vice presidents worked in a separate branch from presidents with whom they had different ideologies and rarely had any relationship. And the vice presidency wasn't a good political springboard for able politicians either. From 1809 until 1959, only one sitting vice president, Martin Van Buren, was elected president. Only one other, John Breckinridge, was nominated for the office. From 1833 until 1911, no vice president was even nominated for a second consecutive term. The Pulitzer Prize winning musical of the early 1930s, Of Thee I Sing, named its clueless vice president Alexander Throttlebottom. <laughs> 
his last name reflecting a widespread perception of vice presidential quality. If you share my view that a system of presidential succession should at least first provide a very capable successor, second, who is ideologically similar to his or her presidential predecessor, so a succession will reflect the most recent presidential election, and third, who is familiar with the executive branch's work and personnel to facilitate the transition, then the vice presidency was poorly suited to that role. The best public servants often didn't want to be vice president. An ideological ticket balancer wouldn't provide continuity. One occupied at Capitol Hill might not be privy to the policies and programs of the executive branch. Vice presidents were positioned to think about presidential health, a preoccupation that didn't foster mutual trust under the circumstances. From 1841 until 1963, eight presidents died in office, four from natural causes, four from assassinations. From 1841 to 1881, four vice presidents, John Tyler, Millard Fillmore, Andrew Johnson, Chester Arthur, succeeded to the presidency. All were ideological ticket balancers whose succession drastically changed governmental policy. Historians have ranked them much closer to the bottom than the top of presidents, and none was nominated for their own presidential term. Theodore Roosevelt, the first 20th century vice president, is on Mount Rushmore, but we got lucky there. TR became President William McKinley's second term vice president reluctantly, because New York Republican leaders wanted to remove him as governor of New York and bury him as vice president. But McKinley was assassinated six months into that term, and Roosevelt became the 26th president. 20, the 20th century vice presidents fared better as successors, but problems remained. Harry S. Truman rarely saw Franklin Roosevelt during his 82-day vice presidency and became president suddenly without knowing of the Manhattan Project, communications with allies, or strategies for ending World War II. Things were even worse when presidents suffered an inability, which left them unable to discharge presidential powers and duties. That occurred during the 80 days between the time President James Garfield was shot and died in 1881, during much of the last 17 months of Woodrow Wilson's presidency following his stroke, and when President Dwight Eisenhower sustained serious illnesses, including a heart attack and a stroke between 1955 and 1957. The Constitution said the vice president would act as president when the president was unable, but didn't say how to determine a presidential inability nor whether the vice president became president, thereby supplanting the president, or simply was a temporary fill-in until the president had recovered. The lack of constitutional clarity and the constitutional, ideological, and personal distance between presidents and vice presidents resulted in presidential power remaining with the incapacitated president not being transferred or exercised during those instances. Fortunately, three interrelated developments improved the vice presidency before Nixon nominated Gerald Ford on, in October 1973. History sometimes displays a sense of irony, and it did here, since each development was associated with Richard Nixon, not President Nixon, but Vice President Nixon. In broad strokes, they were as follows. First, the vice presidency moved to the executive branch when Nixon was vice president. Eisenhower included Nixon in the cabinet, NSC, and legislative meetings, sent him on diplomatic missions, and delegated party work to him. Unlike his predecessors, Nixon spent little time presiding over the Senate. Nixon's executive roles enabled him to waltz to the 1960 Republican presidential nomination and to begin a precedent of an executive branch vice president, which John F. Kennedy followed and to some extent ex expanded with Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson despite their awkward relationship. Johnson's masterful succession after Kennedy's assassination in 1963 enhanced perceptions of the vice presidency. This move to the executive branch responded to historic changes from the Roosevelt and Truman presidencies, including the rise of the presidency, the United States' larger international role in a nuclear age and amidst the Cold War, the development of air transportation, facilitating political and diplomatic travel, and the increased role of presidential candidates in running mate selection. Second, FDR's death in 1945, the Eisenhower inabilities in the mid-1950s, and the Kennedy assassination 
focused attention on presidential succession and inability, a more urgent problem given the presidency's increased importance. In 1957, Eisenhower's administration proposed amending the Constitution to clarify that presidential power could be temporarily transferred by the president or vice president and then reclaimed by the president when the inability ended. When Congress failed to act, Eisenhower and Nixon made and disclosed an agreement whereby either could initiate a temporary transfer of presidential powers and duties to the vice president. Kennedy and Johnson later adopted essentially the same agreement with their vice presidents are next in line. Finally, after the Kennedy assassination, Congress proposed in 1965 and the states ratified in 1967 the 25th Amendment. It adopted, revised forms of the, it re adopted revised forms of the Eisenhower proposals regarding presidential inability and added Section 2, which allowed a president to fill a vice presidential vacancy by nominating a vice president who took office upon confirmation by a majority vote in the Senate and House. The amendment reflected the conclusion that the vice presidency was essential to handling presidential succession and inability, that it was an indispensable executive office and that a president should have a vice president with whom he or she was politically and personally compatible, subject to Congress's ability to review the nomination to ensure competence and character. The amendment's architect, Democratic Senator Birch Bayh, shrewdly drafted Section 2 to imitate familiar practices and pursued a bipartisan approach necessary to amend the Constitution. When Bayh's subcommittee held hearings in January 1964, his star and closing witness, was a Republican lawyer who, having lost two recent political races, was in self-declared political retirement, Richard Nixon. Nixon testified that the nation needed a vice president to handle presidential succession. Placing either the Speaker of the, Ho of the House or Secretary of State first in line risked disrupting party continuity of the, the executive branch or elevating a non-political figure. The vice presidency had migrated to the executive branch and its legislative duties were the least burdensome part of the job, Nixon testified. Its further development depended on selection by the president to promote political and personal compatibility. Nixon preferred reconvening the Electoral College, not using Congress to review the president's nomination. But he repeatedly emphasized that the priority was to rally behind the approach that could attract sufficient support to clear the supermajority hurdles to amend the Constitution. Bayh's proposal was the one, and Nixon was happy to support it. Nixon was not the only voice articulating such ideas, but his thoughtful testimony and the support of Eisenhower, former Attorney General Herbert Brunel, and some congressional Republicans provided the bipartisan support to achieve a constitutional amendment under Bayh's brilliant leadership. History doesn't always follow predictable patterns, and that was true of the first use of Section 2 when Nixon nominated House Minority Leader Ford. Presidential or vice presidential deaths had produced 15 of the prior 16 vice presidential vacancies, but this one followed an unprecedented contingency, a vice presidential re resignation to avoid criminal prosecution. An Agnew's resignation occurred while impeachment clouds darkened over Nixon as special counsel Archibald Cox investigated him and administration and campaign officials regarding Watergate. Since Democrats controlled the House and Senate, the next in line were Democratic Speaker Carl Albert and Senate President Pro Tempore James Eastland. Failure to fill the vice presidential vacancy would transfer executive branch control to the Democrats if Nixon left office prematurely or might complicate impeachment and removal by presenting it as politically motivated. Nixon and Watergate cast a long shadow, but the 25th Amendment and Ford illuminated the path forward. If unconstrained, Nixon probably would have nominated former Treasury Secretary John Connolly. But Connolly would have been a very controversial choice. Ford, however, could be easily confirmed. That's not to say that Congress didn't take its responsibilities seriously. It did. As then freshman Senator Joe Biden said, hours before Nixon nominated Ford, we must impress upon the American people that we do not think this is business as usual, that the man whom we are going to confirm as Vice President of the United States may very well be the next president within the next three years. An exhaustive, three month, exhaustive two month investigation enlisted more than 350 FBI agents from 33 offices 
who conducted more than 1,000 interviews, examined or audited 12 years of Ford's tax returns, scrutinized his health records, bank accounts, votes, speeches, associations, and so forth. Ford testified before the Senate and House on parts of five different days during the 10-day hearings, beginning 12 days after Nixon's Saturday Night Massacre heightened calls for impeachment. Before the Senate Rules Committee on November 1, 1973, Ford declared that, quote, truth is the glue on the bond that holds government together, and not only government, but civilization itself. Two weeks later, he told the House Committee on the Judiciary that, quote, I believe people ought to tell the truth, especially politicians. I believe in friendly compromise. I said over in the Senate hearings, the truth is the glue that holds government together. Compromise is the oil that makes governments go. In late November, the Senate confirmed Ford 92 to 3. On December 6, the House followed suit 387, 387 to 35. 100% of congressional Republicans voting and 87% of congressional Democrats voted to confirm Ford. Of course, few congressional Democrats preferred Ford for president. But that wasn't the test. Talent and experience qualified him, he was honorable, and he reflected the sentiment of the last presidential election. The 25th Amendment helped avert a political and constitutional crisis and enabled the insertion of, of Republican Ford before Albert, his successor, thereby eliminating the, the argument that impeachment was a partisan exercise. And Ford provided a very acceptable solution. He may have been, as he said, a Ford, not a Lincoln. But he spoke to the moment by reaffirming basic principles. After being sworn in as vice president on December 6, 1973, he said, quote, at this moment of visible and living unity, I see only Americans. And he pledged commitment to, quote, the rule of law and equal justice for all Americans, to uphold the Constitution, and within the limited powers and duties of the vice presidency, to do his best for all Americans. Eight months later, on August 9, 1974, Ford became president when Nixon resigned after tapes confirmed his early involvement in the Watergate cover-up, totally eroding his congressional support. Ford's pedigree and manner were modest, but there was nothing ordinary about his commitment to American constitutional democracy. If the words I shared earlier from Mr. Ford's testimony, that truth is the glue that holds government and civilization together, sounded familiar, they should. A slightly polished version was a centerpiece of his inaugural speech. That sentiment was not a speechwriter's belated inauguration soundbite, but Ford's earnest expression of his commitments to timeless principles that are essential to democratic society. He'd repeated those commitments during his vice presidency, and during its last months, Ford wrote that the golden rule should guide political and general behavior. His conduct in succeeding modeled that norm, a long national nightmare was indeed over as President Ford's succession reaffirmed constitutional principles. President Ford's initial Gallup approval rating was 71% with only 3% disapproving, but his approval plummeted to 50% a month later when he pardoned Nixon. Notwithstanding political headwinds from Watergate and the pardon, and from Governor Ronald Reagan's divisive challenge for the 1976 nomination, Ford barely lost to Carter. Carter began his own inaugural address, quote, for myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all he has done to heal our land, an uncommon tribute to Ford's contribution as presidential succession. Let me turn now to the transformation of the vice presidency during the last half century. Notwithstanding its advances and move to the executive branch, Nixon, Johnson, and Hubert Humphrey had all experienced rocky moments as vice president and Agnew's vice presidency had badly tarnished the office. Nixon didn't view Agnew or Ford as a partner. He wanted Ford to defend him on Watergate without knowing the facts. Ford traveled the country as Republican candidates faced a bad outlook in 1974. In mid-1974, the Atlantic Monthly devoted much of two issues to whether the vice presidency should be abolished or seriously reformed. When Ford became president, he took seriously filling the vice presidential vacancy under the 25th Amendment, canvassing opinion before narrowing the choice to Rockefeller, George H.W. Bush, and Donald Rumsfeld, all credible presidential figures. For a new president who hadn't sought office and was widely underestimated, 
Choosing Rockefeller signaled an interest in uniting the country and enlisting a perceived heavyweight. But Rockefeller's vice presidency didn't elevate the office. 10 months after taking office, Rockefeller acceded to Ford's request that he remove himself from the 1976 ticket, the last time a vice president was dumped, only the third time in the 20th century. As Rockefeller left office in January 1977, he said the vice presidency hadn't, quote, taxed his talents or stamina. He viewed the vice president's role as to, quote, merely sit and wait. It all had a rather John Adams ring to it. Ford had wanted to include Rockefeller and gave him a weekly private meeting and high profile assignments, like chairing the domestic council and an in, in, in investigation into CIA abuses. But that wasn't enough, not even close. Rockefeller had the wrong vision of the job. Far from making him consequential, running the domestic council made enemies of those whose turf Rockefeller threatened or who opposed his initiatives. Instead of positioning himself as a generalist at the top alongside the president, it made him resemble others whose portfolios required their proposals be circulated for debate. And Rockefeller wasn't politically in sync with his president. He proposed exp expensive initiatives, whereas Ford barred new programs to control government spending. Moreover, Rockefeller wasn't suited to being a number two. Instead of relieving Ford of problems, he created them. That put him crosswise with Ford's senior staff. When Reagan challenged Ford for the 1976 nomination, Rockefeller became a political burden. While President Ford didn't transform the vice presidency, his fingerprints mark its recent history. In addition to Rockefeller, he helped propel George Bush and Dick Cheney to that office. Bush was runner-up when Ford chose Rockefeller, and Ford burnished his presidential qualifications by posting him to China and at the CIA. In 1980, he recommended that Reagan make Bush his running mate. And Ford gave Cheney his first high-profile positions as deputy chief of staff and chief of staff, experiences which contributed to Cheney's career in the House as secretary of defense and finally vice president. President Ford also launched the national career of Bob Dole, who he selected as his 1976 running mate. At the 1980 Republican convention, Ford became the only former president to seem seriously to consider running for vice president. Negotiations to determine whether the office could be structured to attract a reluctant President Ford captivated the convention, but failed to, as both principals agreed, a co-presidency was impossible. Finally, in 1976, eight years before Mondale made Geraldine Ferraro the first woman on a national ticket, and 44 years before Harris became the first woman elected to national office, President Ford became the first major party presidential candidate seriously to consider a woman, ambassador to the United Kingdom, Anne Armstrong, to be his running mate. It was left to the leaders who followed President Ford, President Carter and Vice President Mondale, to create the White House Vice Presidency. In brief, Carter thought the Vice Presidency should be elevated, wanted help from, from its occupant, and chose his running mate carefully interviewing and thinking seriously about various prospects as governing partners. Carter and Mondale were politically and personally compatible, and Carter valued what Mondale added. Mondale provided the blueprint for a new vice presidency. His study of the office's history convinced him that making it consequential required reimagining the office. The vice president should focus on helping the president be president, on presidential success, not succession. A vice president could best add value as an across-the-board advisor who handled targeted presidential-level operational responsibilities. As a generalist schooled in democratic politics and sharing the president's political destiny, the vice president could provide candid advice from that unique perspective. And the vice president could handle high-level assignments to expand presidential governing capacity. Carter embraced Mondale's proposal and gave Mondale tools to succeed unlimited presidential access, full information, a choice West Wing office, and sustained presidential support by word and by deed. This new model distilled the vice presidency's past, but history wasn't its only source. It also reflected a genuine effort to improve government and an understanding of political institutions, of good management practices, and of human psychology. Carter and Mondale understood that trust and candor would allow them to help each other. 
Mondale told Carter when he disagreed, but generally expressed his disagreement privately, and he and Carter preserved the confidentiality of their discussions. Sometimes Mondale persuaded Carter, sometimes not. But Mondale never wore out his welcome, a tribute to both men. Carter dispatched Mondale on consequential assignments, utilizing a talented partner to expand his own reach. Ford had endorsed the Golden Rule as a guide to political behavior, and Carter and Mondale applied that adage to recreating the vice presidency. After Reagan and Bush defeated Carter and Mondale in 1980, Mondale and his team explained to Bush how they had conducted the vice presidency and why. On inauguration day, Bush publicly endorsed the Mondale model and largely followed it, acting as a valued presidential advisor and operator, especially through skillful diplomatic work. And for the most part, subsequent presidents and vice presidents from both parties have followed and developed the Carter Mondale vice presidential model. Each new vice president has inherited the same choice West Wing office near the Oval Office. They see the president often and act for the White House around town, around the country, and internationally. We often know little about a vice president's advice until after their term ends. Confidentiality is a predicate to vice presidential influence. That doesn't mean that vice presidents should be obsequious. Part of a vice president's value is talking truth to power, and our best vice presidents have. Yet modern vice presidents are visible, consequential operators. Think, for instance, of Dan Quayle chairing the Competitiveness Council, Al Gore running Reinventing Government and at the Kyoto Climate Change Convention, Chaining running the Presidential Emergency Operations Center on 9-11 in, in President George W. Bush's absence that day, Biden negotiating budget compromises with Republican legislative leaders in implementing the Recovery Act. These are but a few of many such snapshots from recent vice presidencies. Indeed, Vice President Harris is just back today from Indonesia, where she attended summits with leaders of nations in the Indo-Pacific. President Biden attended such sessions last year, underscoring the presidential status of this assignment. The trip was Harris's third to Southeast Asia, in addition to a mission to Japan and Korea, priority areas for the administration's foreign policy. She has also been to Europe four times, speaking twice at the prestigious Munich Security Conference, holding important meetings in France, traveling to Poland and Romania after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as well as a trip to Africa earlier this year. And she's been a vocal spokesperson for administration domestic priorities and legislative accomplishments. She and most of her recent predecessors often act as presidential stand-ins, not standbys. Not surprisingly, each vice president operates differently as presidential advisor and operator. Every president differs in their strengths, weaknesses, and leadership style. Every vice president differs also. And every administration encounters a different context. Somewhere in the interplay of those three variables, president, vice president, and context, each White House vice president finds his or her sweet spot as advisor and operator. The vice president is no longer a political dead end. Being vice president doesn't guarantee you'll become president, but it provides a big boost and has since Nixon's vice presidency. Of the 14 vice presidents since Nixon took office in 1953, five, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Bush, and Biden, became president through succession or election, and three others, and Nixon in 1960, were nominated but lost. Three, Nixon, Humphrey, and Gore in very close races. In those likelihoods, 36% of vice presidents since Nixon becoming president, 57% being nominated, understate things when you consider that the six who haven't been presidential nominees or presidents include, among others, Cheney, who disclaimed any interest in running for president, Pence, a candidate now, and Harris, who hasn't had a chance to run since becoming vice president. And vice presidents who don't become president still get to be vice president. Being vice president presents delicate challenges, frustrations, and constraints. But few have such opportunity to influence public policy, to handle delicate diplomatic assignments, to shape public opinion. That's why Mr. Cheney, with one of history's most impressive political resumes, left a lucrative CEO position to become vice president for eight years without any remaining presidential ambitions. 
He recognized that the vice presidency had grown since he and President Ford left the White House in 1977, and its continued progress since he and President George W. Bush left in 2009. The story of the vice presidency teaches that constitutional institutions can change, even dramatically and beneficially. An officer who once performed inconsequential legislative duties now is part of the White House. An institution that addressed presidential succession poorly evolved to better fulfill that mission, and then was transformed into a consequential White House role that made the successor function secondary. And yet as the successor role became less central, the role office developed to provide more involved and able vice presidents who are better positioned as presidential successors. This inspiring account does not suggest all vice presidential behavior will conform to neat patterns. History rarely does so. Although the vice presidency has become part of the White House, the, mo the most historic moment of Pence's vice presidency was as president of the Senate during the electoral vote count. And Harris is poised to set the record for most Senate ties broken, a development that says more about the Senate than the vice presidency. Nor should we assume change has ended. The decreasing number of competitive states may affect the dynamics of vice presidential selection. And although we expect vice presidents to be centrally engaged in the presidential administration, the level of involvement depends on presidents and vice presidents. A president who cares only about himself or herself, who discourages candid advice, who feels threatened by his or her vice president, will not reap the governing benefits from the White House vice presidency. Nor will a vice president who doesn't understand the role or who prioritizes ambition over administration programs or performs poorly. Nonetheless, to understand the vice presidency and other constitutional institutions, who we are and who we wish to be, we must study our history and our ideals, their creation and development, their progress, the inspiration they provide and the ways we fall short of our constitutional aspirations, how change context reshapes institutions, even in unexpected places, how imitated practice creates new patterns, how old institutions are capable of being reimagined to enhance our constitutional democracy. What's past is often prologue, but sometimes it's not. But even then, even when history takes unexpected turns, knowledge of the past in all of its dimensions may lessen our surprise Suggest, suggest strategies to respond and help light the proper path forward. Yet the story of the Vice Presidency reminds us that American history doesn't just happen. It's a story, an important part, of the response of human beings to events, of the vital importance of presidents, vice presidents, other public servants, and citizens in applying and shaping constitutional ideals and values. It matters who they are and who we are whether they and we have the character, the knowledge, commitment, and ability to sustain and improve our institutions and our constitutional democracy, whether they and we insist on truth as the glue that binds government, indeed civilization, together, and regard the golden rule as a model for political and other behavior. That is part of the lesson of the Vice Presidency, lessons that reverberate in this museum and library. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We will take a very short 15-minute uh, break. We will be back at 7 o'clock. We have to change the stage and the chairs uh, for our first lecture panel on the uh, uh, photographers of the vice presidents. So 15-minute break. Please come back at 7 o'clock. <laughs>